Ayan sa I am Stephen Hyland, manager of film and public programs at the New York Museum of Art. Uh, we do a lot of great film programming at the museum. And I just want to do a quick plug. This summer, July 10th to the 14th, is the 50th New York Black Film Festival. If you don't know about that, if you don't know about that, you should. It's the oldest um, black film festival in the country. So. You know, the 50th one is a big one. We're planning it right now, and it's going to be great. Um, and now we'll hand it over um, to David. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dave Rodriguez, and I'm the executive producer at the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Um, more importantly today, Max was a dear, dear friend. Um, so I'm really honored to participate in his 100th birthday celebration, boy, that's hard to say. Um, Max always told me that he was born in Dismal Swamp in the Carolinas, and it took two days to get to registering his birth, so he said it was the 8th, we say it's the 10th, but he deserves an entire month, so we're really happy to be doing this. Um, I want to thank some of our sponsors, TD Bank, Jackson Lincoln Center, Dodge. Uh, the Dodge Foundation and Dodge Poetry, and the PSE&G Foundation. I also really want to thank the uh, New York Museum of Art for their partnership tonight and the New York Black Film Festival. Um, I want to remind you that this, I guess, a week from tomorrow, we are um, doing a version of the Freedom Now Suite, you'll see it mentioned in this film, celebrating Max's centennial with Cassandra Wilson, Ravi Coltrane, Sonia Sanchez, Saul Williams, Nasheed Waits, uh, the Last Poets, our Mayor uh, Ross Baraka, all kinds of different folk, and it's going to be amazing. And equally amazing after the film today, we will have a moderated discussion with <clears throat> Raul Roach and Dara Roach, um, Max's son and daughter, and the two filmmakers, Sam Pollard and Ben Shapiro. Thank you so much for coming out on a night like this for something so very special. Have a great evening. Yeah.
pleasure and an honor to introduce the members of our panel today. Um, ben Shapiro and Sam Pollard. Dropouts, but I think it was a projection system. <laughs> it's, it's been a part. Even with it, but I did it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be moderating. Um, so, and then I think I see some mics, so we're going to open it up to questions. So if I miss anything, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, I was going to start talking with. Um, you, <laughs> Sam, and every, we, do we, we we had an introduction, so everyone knows everyone is. But um, this is an amazing film, and I feel like our family is so privileged to have been a part of the film. Um, to see so many people who we've grown up with, including you, of course, <laughs> Sam. I remember you, the young man in the in the, um, in the video. Long time ago. A long, long, long time ago. And I think my first question is, you know, you said 35 years. What does it, I mean, you've made many, many movies and, and documentaries over the years. How does this compare to those and, 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 and how does it feel to do work on something for 35 years? Well, I'll be very frank. I, it's such a satisfying feeling when I watch this material, when I watch this film, because knowing your dad, that I did for that period of time from 87 to 94, it was just, you know, it was, it was my first film as a director. You know, it was the first film I ever directed. I've been an editor for a long time, and Saint had just shot your dad performing a solo to one of Dr. King's poems for this film, one well, of Lexi Hughes' poems. I was editing the film for saying about lengths to use. I didn't know he did that, okay. Yeah, he did that. No, not in FBI, but it's called mm -hmm. Lengths to Use the yeah. Dreamkeeper. Mm -hmm. And after I cut that sequence, I remember saying to Saint, man, somebody needs to do a film about Max Roach. And he said, man, you should do it. So I was startled, because I had never directed anything. But he introduced me to your dad. dad your dad was playing SOBs with M. Boom. And I went down to M. Boom with Saint. After the set, we went down and met your dad, and I proposed doing a film about it. And he immediately said yes, you know. And then we had to try to raise some money. We raised, the initial grant was from the New York State Council of the Arts. And the first thing we shot was the interview. When your dad's in that big chair, we took his house, and Paul Carter Harrison interviewed your dad. And we shot in the, in the house on Central Park West. And then the second thing we shot was the rehearsal section session with Boom. And that was at Warren's studio? No, that was at a studio on 41st Street off of, okay. off of Ninth Avenue. Yeah, that's where we shot that. So it was like the Umboom era. That's right. That's and cool. then his record company, which was, was the Italian Black Saint. Black Saint gave us some money to go to Italy where he did that concert where he was the soloist with the wooden, wood, wood, wooden string ensemble in Milan. And so we were off and running until I put a cut together and then I hated it. <laughs> and I put it away for years. I took it, I would take it out, I would look at it, I'd make some changes, and I put it away. I said, oh, this is awful, this is awful, this is awful. So what, what, what did you not like? What was missing? I mean, now that you see it completed, what's, what's the difference? It was, it was very different, right? It was a very different film. Because initially, it was just going to be your dad, nobody else. I was just going to focus completely on Max Roach. I wasn't going to interview anybody else. But in the mid-90s, I took it out, I took it out and showed it to some students when I was teaching at NYU. And they said, yes, why don't you shoot some other people? So I originally shot the sheep. Um, who played in the boom at the time? Uh, what was the other young one? Eli. 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 I shot those guys. Okay. And 
and Steve Barrios. And I cut them into the film and I couldn't stand it. <laughs> so I put it back on the show. And then fast forward, Mr. Shapiro, who I had known because he was a camera person, we had worked together. We were hanging out one day and he said, I was talking about the Roach film. And Ben said, let me see some of the footage. So I took him to NYU. I showed him the rough cut. I showed him some of the outtakes on 16 millimeter. We shot this on 16. And Ben said, man, you got to finish this film. And thank God for Ben Shapiro. <laughs> thank you, sir. Well, and on that note, I mean, so I want to turn to you, Ben, because you were working, and I didn't know this, um, except for the film, but you were working also on your own project, my first project. Can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that and what inspired you? Yeah, well, I mean, it talks about a little bit of the film, but I mean, this goes back to when I was a, a kid. I got interested in the drums, and I was taking lessons when I was like 15, 16, 17. And uh, from an interesting guy who was, um, he was actually uh, uh, studying for his PhD at UCLA, and but he was doing an analysis of drum drumming. He was, I remember him doing this like computer like digitization analysis of Tony Williams solos and things like that. And so, but he was introduced me to to technique and approach to playing, and he was just very clear that like that your dad, that Max Roach, was this fundamental figure in just the playing, how the instrument is played. And so, and, and, and I knew about the music, learned more about the music, and he was, Max Roach was a central figure for me musically and otherwise. And, and so then I, um, I also produced radio, radio documentaries for public radio. And so I um, pitched NPR in the late 80s, 88, 89, to do a half hour radio documentary about Max and went to his apartment in Central Park West, the apartment that Sam, the same, by the same time Sam had been shooting. And we sat down for, it was a couple of days, or a couple of days, and he just kind of told me his life story, pretty much. And a lot of that audio that you hear in the film is voiceovers from, from that interview. Um, and then I did another, uh, I was, another NPR hour-long documentary in the early 90s. Did another couple of in hours interview. And so that's, or more than audio came about. So that was um, how I, uh, that was the work I'd done previously. And then and as Sam said, I knew about his footage and, and uh, I was working on films and documentary that by that point. And so I proposed with him that we, you know, finish his film. I mean, when I'm listening to both of you talk, I'm just thinking about just the passion that journalists and documentarians have. I mean, to work on something, have so much footage, and then say, I don't like it. I mean, <laughs> so any, any filmmakers out there, I mean, it is really a, a huge passion project. And also, you have extremely high standards. I mean, and it shows, you know, in, in the finished product, I think that it's, you know, from my standpoint, I just, I've watched it several times and I just can't stop watching it. I see something new every single time. Um, and, you know, this year our dad turned, would have turned 100, um, and there's a lot going on. How do you feel like, it? how do you feel like this and, well, let me ask you, this is my brother, we have a role. Um, how do you, you know, looking at it from our perspective, how do you think it, it's preserving his legacy, this film? You know, I think it, it is a wonderful testament to who he was as a person and as an artist. Um, a lot of people uh, have come up to me and said various things about the film. Well, why didn't they include the, the uh, Charlie Mingus, Duke Ellington, uh, trio record, and you know, why did they do this? And the, oh, and they didn't talk about that. And I said, Here are two artists that are working in tradition of Max Roach an original approach, they're auteurs, they have a specific goal to really talk about how he met the challenges of being not just an artist, but a human being who wanted to make the world a better place and use his ability to do something about it, and how, how that impacted his career. That's what the film, to me, was all about.
it wasn't like, well, first you did that, then you do this, then you went there, then you went that one. It's not that. There, there are lots more stories to tell, I think, about Max Roach, but this story was central to who he was and how he impacted society and how the powers that be pushed back. And so I think, for me, what I love most about the film and what I think his legacy carries forward is the fact that he was a warrior, that he determined that despite money, despite anything, he was going to say what he had to say because it was the right thing to do as a human being. So for that, I'm grateful for the film that you made. And I think that is the legacy I'd like new generations to have going forward because we need more Max Roaches out here in the world. We need more artists who are going to take the hit and go into battle and make a difference. Yeah, and I, and I... You know, one point in the film, to that point, um, I can't remember who it was, but it was saying, you know, has anything like we insist been made like that since that point? And um, an artist who, who do that, I think those are really strong moments in the film where it really kind of gave me this kind of aha. Like, I mean, I know, I know my dad, obviously, who he was, but to see um, like those kinds of moments that really stand out in his career um, as being really unique to and as a Max Roach, to Max Roach. And so I just wanna ask each of you also in your mind, what makes Max Roach sort of unique? And from the filmmaker standpoint, was there anything in there that, that you found out that was, that was interesting or, and surprising? So I want to open that up to you guys. Well, for me, what makes Max unique is exactly what Raul said. Raul said. I mean, the fact that he was just not a musician. He was a phenomenal human being who said, you know, I'm, just, I'm not just here to entertain you. You know, I'm here to challenge you, too. So when you listen to Max and his evolution, from playing with Charlie Parker and Dizzy and Bud Powell and Monk to Clifford Brown to Warren Smith and, and Omar Clay and to playing, you know, behind Abby Lincoln, the wonderful dynamic Abby Lincoln, Dee Dee Bridgewater, playing with, you know, Cecil Bridgewater and Billy Harper, you know, and O.B. Pope. This guy was a, and you know, and your sister with the, with the Uptown String Quartet. The guy was just a phenomenal musician. He was, and he was a, he was an artist. Pro excellence. He was an artist for excellence. I remember going to Talani Davis's house. You know Talani Davis? And up on her wall, she had a picture of your dad. And I said, why, why you got a picture of Max up there? Because she was married to Joseph Jarman from the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And one of Joseph Jarman's biggest heroes was your dad, Max Roach. Max Roach, man, was a trailblazer. He's a major trailblazer, you know. To me, one of the greatest musicians in the 20th century, in my opinion. <laughs> one day we wake up and my dad's doing a ballet with Alvin Ailey and there's Alvin Ailey sitting in the house. And I mean, you just can't, you can't imagine um, what it's like to just every day be an environment of creativity, and it is. It's like a gift, like every, you know, constantly that you're that you're that you're able to open, it and you just have no idea where you know where things are going um, from there. So I, that's she a, remembers it as a gift. Huh? For us, it was a lot of work. Because <laughs> you couldn't be around my father unless you worked. And so. Uh, yeah, it was great too. Well, it was tell them a little bit about that. Like, let's open a gift. It's like, okay, do this, do that, do this. Yeah, yeah oh, we well, help me carry drums. I was a drum carrier. You were, you were the drum carrier. I carried a few when they came in. I mean, dragged them. I, mean, I was a toddler. <laughs> I did. I tried. I was. I was honestly extremely excited when they come off the road, 
And um, I'd run to the door and we'd pretend that we were helping. I mean, we thought we were helping, carrying the drums, unloading these two things into the, into the house. <laughs> And then, and then we were there a lot when, like, the tours, we helped organize some tours. Yeah. Office work, my dad put everybody to work, because it's true, like, at a certain point, he was managing himself, and um, decided if he was going to make an album, he was going to fund it himself. He was also an incredible businessman, and I think that's the part that I liked when I watched, talked when Abby talked about signing that check. And that's really, I mean, that I think is is another side that you don't get to see so much. But there's a lot in the Library of Congress, his his contracts and everything, that documents just what kind of businessman he he really really was. So um, you know, I, it was it was amazing. In the house. So you remember when they put together that concert that was in Verona with him and Tony? And Ginger Baker, yeah, that was, and then Boom was there too. Yeah, he put that. That was a Max Roach production. Yeah, that was incredible, and they had it in. Uh, they filmed the whole thing. It was an amazing performance, you know, in a big <coughs> stadium. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the video company messed it up. The music was ruined. The, the, they couldn't sync it to picture. We had a picture, but the music is a mess. But uh, yeah, it was amazing. Um, I think, you know, with the centennial happening right now, I think obviously your dad's not here to represent himself, but there's so many amazing musicians and performances that are going to pay tribute to him and this music and this. I think style of artistry. Um, what do you think this year represents, and what do you want people to take away from it? I, I think, again, growing up and traveling with my father was very fortunate. He took me to Europe when I was fifteen. I'd be on the road with him, you know, lugging drums, and he paid well too, actually. <laughs> but. Um, um, I think it was just, um, I, I want people to hear and to get a sense of some of the incredible creativity and musicianship that he was able to um, create. Uh, I remember being in rooms with just 60 people with him and Elvin Jones in a drum battle, which we do have on tape actually, it'll be coming out. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I just want people to, to know him and to share, and being our, our father's children, you know, making the world a better place for human beings, making the planet a better place. I hope that he continues to inspire not just people, but artists in particular that can speak to people from their own voice about what needs to be done, what we need to pay attention to. And it's not reality to you. It's real life. It's making a real difference. And I think on that note, um, <laughs> uh, Sam, I, you know, you know, and um, that I want to ask you, you've been presenting this documentary for quite, for a few months. How long, when did it, when did it first premiere? October. PBS. PBS in October. So how do you think are people how do you think people are receiving it? Are they getting the message message? I know you do a lot of these these Q and A's and speaking engagements. Anything that stands out to you that that you've received from the people who are who've been watching the movie? Everybody I know I know who've seen the film has been very positive. The response has been Unanimously positive for this film. Because it's an opportunity to see. I mean, we, when we showed it in Brooklyn, a couple of drummers came up to me after and said, Man, wow, to see Max in all those different iterations was really compelling. I screened it in uh, Baltimore at a festival in August. 
And another drummer came to me afterwards and it was like compelling. And the audience members said how much they loved it. That's something we never see in Max perform in nightclubs or in, in concerts and stuff. Now, it's been very, very positive and it's still showing. I mean, we get an email from this distributor every other week about it's showing in, where'd you go, Iceland? It was in Reykjavik, it was in Reykjavik, it yeah. was in a premiere, it's in some playing festivals. I'm doing well in Europe, but I'm playing at festivals yeah. in Europe, and, and you know, continues that, it's continuing that this next year, and, and hopefully it will be on television and internationally. Um, but yeah, there's some period, it's been very well received, people respond to it very, very well. Because um, he's a legend. The man's a legend. You know, and, it, and you know, it's like people who, you know, Younger generation, those who are musicians, they know who he is. They, they heard of him. Now they get to know about him. The man was a legend. Your dad was a legend. <laughs> I, I think, you know, that's true. It's hard, you know, for us to lose my dad. He watched me run track and do, we did a lot of mundane things as well. Um, but it is true when we've heard from, I've heard from a number of people, young and old and young, you know, who just, I think the activism, the, it's the musicianship, but it's also the things that my dad said that reached people, um, even today, that resonates today about freedom, about, about unity, about just being, uh, like a human being in this world, and that we talking about, you know, man's inhumanity, man, and even talking about how he organized Boom to be very equitable. And so it's all of these themes that I think that, and what I'm receiving is that theme of, of, of just having purpose to your music is very, you know, very important to people. I don't know if you guys have, if you've heard that. Yeah, it's purpose to your music. That's what he had. And, and remember when I said in the film that there's no wasted motion in the match rooms? You watch him sitting at the drums, kid. The guy, is, there's no wasted motion. You watch him perform. <laughs> you watch him, you know, performing the double quartet, no wasted motion. You watch him playing with Fat Five Freddy in the kitchen, no wasted motion. This man was always in the pocket, you know? And when you listen to the music and from, from Freedom Now Suite, it's political, it's emotional, but it's swinging. Max is swinging. I mean, the guy, one of the greatest drummers in terms of playing that hi-hat, playing rhythm, <laughs> phenomenal. One of the greatest drummers who could play with Abdullah Ibrahim on one end, and Cecil Taylor on the other. What kind of musician? How many musicians could do that? It's it's rare, <laughs> and that's the thing. I just don't. I can't really. The guy was. He's a master. Yeah. He's a monster. This guy. <laughs> From a musician standpoint, is absolutely as well. We got a lot of the, you know, themes drilled, <laughs> drilled into us. You know, I think growing up, we had a lot of. Um, uh, there was a lot of talk of obviously freedom and social 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 activism. Raul worked in that space with um, Harry Belafonte um, as well. And so it, it, sometimes for me, the musicianship kind of, it doesn't fall to the back, but it's also just, it's a part of who he was. And he really did, you know, at a certain point when I came around, he really did make music that had a certain activism to it. That was, that was interesting. It was, yeah, he, was, he was responding to, I mean, over and over. He was, I mean, that's one of the things that's, that I think drives the film and that makes him remarkable as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artist and as an activist is, you know, whatever context he was in. And the film, I think we try to do this in the film by kind of setting, talking about the context of the different times mm -hmm. that he would respond to those times and, and produce a creative response. And that was brilliant over and over and over responding again to whatever time that he was in. And, um, and as, you, as you were saying, in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very political way, in a consciously political way. And I think that's something that I hear back from, from audiences too. That that's very, that's very inspiring, it's very, um, uh, it ma maintains currency for whatever generation you're in, 
whatever you're trying to do, the people want to be creative and they want to make work that's responsive to their times. And here's someone who did it over and over and over and over. If I, if I could describe a through line, I would say it started with him being a drummer. Not just a black kid, poor, growing up, standing on the bread line during depression in, in, in Bed-Stuy. Yeah, that helps to form you. That helps to form part of who you are. The excellence that came out of him, the dedication and the love he had for his instrument. But part of it was just being a drummer. And what a drummer was supposed to do was keep time. And everybody else on the front line got to do the amazing things musically, and the back line was to keep the rhythm together. And that was their role. It was almost like slavery. So when Kenny Clark came along with his invention of you know, using the ride symbol, and my dad came along to expand upon that, it was about freeing the drummer from a subservient role. And most people who worked with him liked working with him um, because... He paid well. <laughs> he, he did. He, 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 well, he would know. He, he worked well, but he did. He paid well. But I think he also allowed people that freedom, that call and response, that um, uh, Sonny Rollins, what's he talking about in the film, right? Sonny Rollins was talking about. I mean, that I hear so, so, it's so prevalent in my favorite songs, which is like, I, I mean, I love Um Boom, hands down. And um, in certain songs, I love the Clifford Brown Quartet. George's Dilemma is like my favorite. Quintet favorite song, and it has that call and response in there. I think that's great, what was so unique about his music when you just think about musicianship. And so I want to ask you one question, because you guys, you've, you've listened to so much um, and talked to so many musicians. Is there a piece of music that stands out to you that you, and it's okay to be biased, it doesn't have to be one, but is there something, some Max Roach, um, I mean, I have my favorites, but any favorites for you? Maybe it could even be in a band, like time, era, but anything that's your particular favorite, Max Roach era? My favorite was the first one that I sort of listened to that really caught me and paid, made me pay attention to Max. It's the Members Don't Get Weary album. That one was like Gary Bartz, Stanley Cow, Jimmy Merritt, Charles Tolliver, and your dad. I said, whoa, every composition on that album was Oh, special. The tone, the rhythm, the texture was special. Then I went back and I listened. I had listened before, but that one really struck me. That one, that's the one that, that stands out for me. When did that come out? Well, 66, right? 68. 68, 69, okay. And what I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, um, I don't know, maybe this is not uh, as courageous as it might be, but I can't pin down to any one thing. And that's, I think that's partly because I think of them as kind of like there, I, I like yeah. There's a solo of drum pieces, which are very special and have always meant a lot to me. Um, there's the Clifford Brown group, which is that stuff is just you know it's just it's phenomenal and it's just a, it's a, a unique thing and also expressive of its time um, and and also expressive. I'm always struck in the in the film when Max talks about it, that was the first time he was able to express his vision as a leader of a group. Because that, and Sonny Rollins says that too, that, that 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 band was really about Max in some way. And I think that's really, that's really true. Um, and, but, and I, and I listen, I've also gone through times when I've listened to the Boom um, music a lot. Um, that's very, it's, it's completely unique and special and powerful and engaging. And so, you know, I, um, and I say those, and, and we insist, always had it really impacted me. Um, and so I guess I kind of feel like, why would I, why would I leave any of those on, on the table, you know? It's like, there's a t I can't really think of anyone, because they're so different, and they're so, um, they're, each, they're all special, and they're all so different, and so I, and I have connections, I listen to different ones at different points in my life, kind of for different reasons, too. When I think about them, I think, oh, I listen to, I was listening to them a lot, you know, at this point in my life, and, and 
So yeah, I can't have a broad kind of look at it, I guess. See, my brother's chomping at the bit because I know what his favorite one is. Go ahead, say it. Yeah, he's thinking now, but you don't. You know, I, members don't get weary of such a, uh, an incredible album. And Equipoise is probably the record I listen to the most to bring you into a Zen state. Um, so that's that. But I, I, I agree with Ben, I can't you know, just go one place. So I'm going to have to go with Lift Every Voice and Sing and Garden Prayer, which I love. And then I'll mention the two that you learned, Joy Do, which is my middle name. And <laughs> was the reason my dad and mom met. And uh, Raul. It's his song. Uh, and, and Raul, which, which you know, is uh, the only the, one who has one. With the quintet after the loss of, of Clifford uh, with Kenny Doyle. And so, uh, yeah, that, that would be it. I knew it. He's so, the only one who had that privilege. So I didn't even have to ask. Um, I'm gonna, I think it's, I mean, you've been listening to us kind of go on for a minute. I have a, a lot more questions I might kind of, kind of intersperse it, but um, if there's any questions that you guys have from the audience, um, or anything you want to ask us personally, or anything like that, you can come up. I think there's, there's microphones set up, right? I love the film, it's fabulous. And I was honored both times. I don't know if all of you are familiar with the Carlton um, record store in Manhattan in the 40s. And I heard um, Amy Gooding talk about Max. Talk a little bit about, he loves to talk about this, uh, Max Roach 100. There's a year of, of performances, like we said, uh, next week at, um, at NJ Pack, which is going to be an incredible ensemble. We Insist Live, so you got to see it here with Abby. But Cassandra Wilson, I've seen her, is, is amazing. So if you can get out there, please, please. Anything else from that? Well, I think, you know, I just want to thank you guys because you kicked off uh, the centennial year with such a great piece of work that really spoke to um, the level at which we would love to see him commemorated. About five years ago, my siblings and I came together and started calling people and organizations, uh, performing arts centers around the world that had worked with that. And to their credit, they all said yes. David Rodriguez at MJ, NJ Pack and Whitney Marcellus at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center were the first ones. And yeah, they have uh, six performances over the next two days, Friday and Saturday at Dizzy's and at Rose Hall with the orchestra. But uh, they were the first to come to four. But also, a lot of the work, and when I was in college, I got to work with uh, Alvin Ailey one summer because Dad and Alvin were friends and they did works together. They did three works together. And they presented this season where they had done Survivors, a piece that was dedicated to uh, Nelson and Winnie Mandela and our family had a chance to see that this previous season and it's wonderful and, and NJ Pack is going to present that again in the spring. Uh, I want to recommend instead of naming all of the now over 60 events worldwide going forward over the next year into next year, the Kennedy Center and other organizations, the Wexner, the Hammer in, in, uh, in UCLA uh, and its hometown which just had a great celebration on his uh, on his actual birthday uh, in Newland, North Carolina. But I want to recommend everyone go to www.maxroach.com, which is managed by my sister. And there's a calendar there. <laughs> the calendar. <laughs> and uh, we have we we're entering events into the calendar as the venues announced. So what you'll see is, I don't know, we have, I think, 23 uh, events, uh, 48 performances from now through April, and that will be constantly updated, but only as the venues announce their own marketing. So there'll be, at the Joyce Theater, it's going to be eight performances with uh, Mount Paso dancers from Cuba and Ron K. Brown's um, 
Evidence troupe from uh, Bed Stuy, Brooklyn, and the I. Kitchen, we're redoing so the hip hop. This is my favorite. Okay. The hip hop and jazz collab collaboration with yeah. Amir and um, well, Questlove and um, and Fab, 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 Fab and yeah. and um, not Amir. Who else? Kennedy Center. Yeah, 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 you're talking about you're talking about Kamal. Kamal. Jersey. No, 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 no call him Kamal. Yeah, Q tip. Q tip. I'm oh, sorry. Q tip. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's gonna be exciting uh, in the fall. And uh, many of these things are, are touring around. Uh, Witness doing eight performances so far with Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra along the East Coast. We'll see how many more are added to that, but we're really looking forward to those performances as well. And uh, yeah, just want to keep it going. And the film can also be seen. So if any of you have friends who haven't seen the film, and it's really even for people who don't know Max Roach, I think that it's just very inspiring, and, and you saw why here. But it can be seen as well. You can see it on. Yeah, it's on Amazon now, Amazon Prime. It's also on Apple TV. Yeah, and it's can you go to PBS.org still? It's yeah, still on so PBS.org. Yeah. Yeah, pbs.org. So please, you know, let people know because I think it's it's wonderful for young I know so many young musicians today and young people who have gotten a lot out of this. And just as a side note, you know, Dad was mentioned in the Biggie um, movie documentary because of just how I think it was his his teacher who who kind of had him practice along to yeah Donald Harrison who lived in Bed Stuy would work with Biggie on his uh, cadence. And there's a, there's a scene in the film where they have Biggie and Dad, and Biggie's rapping and Dad is playing the drums, and you can hear the cadence, because Donald Harrison would uh, show Biggie, yeah, you need to be different, you need to, be, to change your cadence. Listen to Max Roach, and to Biggie's credit, he did. And so he did a lot of things that were kind of that very choppy kind of style that Dad would play in and Biggie would rap in. So that was an interesting thing. Yeah, so, yeah, please share. And do you want to, do we have any more questions or comments? Okay, everybody come on up. Let's pour a little wine. Or whatever, however you guys want to organize it.